worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your Amen, and good morning. Welcome to South River Park Church. This is the first Sunday of May. Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and then the weekend after that, we have a busy weekend on the 18th and the 19th. Let me give you a quick rundown. That morning on the 18th, the ladies are having a prayer breakfast, and then that evening on Saturday at 5 o'clock on the 18th, the chess things are going to be in concert, and we're going to have a meal and as a part of the intermission and so that's going to be a big evening. Again, that's at 5 o'clock on the 18th. We're also going to take up a little love offering for the Chestang group. And so come prepared for that as well. And then the next day in the morning worship service, Reverend Mylon Dekich is going to be here, our state pastor. And he's going to bring the message that morning. You've heard him before, I know. And he's a wonderful person, great speaker. I'm looking forward to having him here with us as our guest. And then that afternoon after church, we're going to have a fish fry, and the women are sponsoring that as a part of their fundraiser for their women's retreat that's coming up this fall. So we've got a lot to squeeze in on those two days. So that's going to be the 18th and the 19th, so it's going to be an exciting weekend. And then, of course, our Vacation Bible School is at the end of the month. It begins the day after Memorial Day, the Tuesday through that Saturday. And see Stephanie if you uh, have any questions and would like to volunteer. We always enjoy those volunteers, so be pre thinking about that, because that's coming up really, really soon. And Gentry has some announcements about youth, because with summer coming up, 
that means youth camps. So Gentry, take it away. I've got to turn myself up. Here we go. Um, May 19th is also um, graduation Sunday. So if you know a graduate that's graduating high school, college, masters, whatever it is, we want to honor them. I need their information um, or we don't know that they're graduating. So far, I have zero people's information. So if we don't have any graduates, we'll just let um, Pastor Mylan preach. But if we have graduates, we want to honor them. Um, we also are getting ready for camp. I need counselors terribly. The deadline for senior high camp is two days ago, but we're still hoping to get more counselors because we need some more. If you want to come hang out with some awesome kids and change their life, I mean, there's nothing like it. I've been going for over a decade and my life was completely changed at Chula Vista. And I promise if you give the Lord the chance, he will change your life through those kids. Those kids are incredible. Um, if you want to counsel, come see me. We've got kids from six through 18. So we've got different weeks for those kiddos. We also have camps for kiddos six through 18. So if you have a kid that wants to go to camp, please come see me and let me know which of your kids is going so that we can arrange a ride up there because it is a little bit of a drive. So we need to make sure we have rides ready for everybody that's going. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Let's all stand as we prepare. No, actually, stay seated. <laughs> because, just one second, Miss Trisha, um, Brother Mike's going to be playing for us. And I thought, well, I'm not going to have you stand and then be seated and stand and be seated. But Miss Trisha wants to say something. Oh, Tim, good to see you, Tim. Go ahead, Tim. Well, you're very welcome, Tim, and thank you to all of you who showed up to help, because I often say it, that the more people that pitch in, the quicker you can get things done, and it's a big job, so thank you for all you who were there. It was a great day. Weather was perfect, so it wasn't too hot. It's great. Thank you, Ms. Tricia, for arranging that. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you today. Thank you that you are here, Lord, for you give meaning and purpose to our lives. You have transformed us through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for what Jesus has done for us on the cross. May we sing your praises today and worship you in spirit and in truth. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. On May 5th, 1951, little baby girl was born in Paducah, Kentucky to a farm family. She was so sweet and precious, they said, let's name a holiday after her, and they called it Cinco de Mayo. I asked the card shop for an anniversary birthday card for Sally, and they said, well, we don't have such a thing. Well, she's celebrating the 20th anniversary of her 53rd birthday. I got to find one. She's such a blessing. Wondered if you could all join me, the vocal band, and Ruth in serenading her with happy birthday. Happy birthday to you.
had lied to her and said, I need her up here to keep me from falling or slipping. Yes, God, I lied today. I'll be in trouble later. That's right. Happy birthday, sweetheart. Stay here. Thank you so much for helping me out. Bill Gaither has, you can sit down. Bill Gaither has written more gospel songs than any other gospel writer in the history of the planet. His most famous song I'd like to share with you here today. It touches me. I hope it touches you because Jesus has touched me. The song says, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me.
We're going to look at our focus verse for the month of May, which is a new one, being that this is the first Sunday of the month. This is something that Mike and Sally just did to the glory of God. Everything that we do, we are to do to the, to the glory of God. This is a, one of those verses that is, helps, helps guide our lives because everything we look at, we can kind of check and say, am I doing this for the glory of God? And it kind of helps us to look at our conduct and say, am I doing this for God's glory? And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this verse or not. Uh, I, this was one that was kind of uh, hammered into my head as a young adult by my pastor because this is one he loved. You know, some pastors love certain verses, and he would often quote this one. And so this one was one that really uh, got nailed into my heart. And so say it with me, beginning with the verse reference. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31. We all like to eat, drink. You know. And so, you know, they say bring food and the whole church will show up, right? Pretty much. So that's good stuff. And when I say drink, I'm talking about, you know, coffee, sweet tea. There you go. Yeah. Soda pop. I can't figure out how you all say it down here. You know, I always said pop, and they laugh at me. Is it soda? Yeah, i got to figure that one out. Yeah, yeah. everything's Coke. I, I, I get conflicting reports. Well, on to more serious matters. Uh, we want to pray today because, uh, well, we always want to pray, but our brother over here, Gerald's having surgery tomorrow. He had it scheduled for last month. But uh, due to his injury, he had to postpone it till May, and so now he's on schedule for tomorrow. So uh, be praying for him that uh, he'll have successful surgery tomorrow. And uh, also, he and I were talking beforehand and talking about Israel and the need to pray for Israel and all that's going on there in that country and that area, and also even here in our own country with all the unrest that has come as a result of that. Uh, keep those, these things in your prayers, and of course, not just here at the church, but in your prayers at home, to be praying for these things, for peace and wisdom uh, to be granted and, and obeyed. So let's stand together as we pray, and then remain standing for songs as we join our hearts together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful today to be able to stand in your presence. We are so thankful that you are a God that invites us into your throne room to pray and to give thanks for all your mighty, mighty deeds. Lord, it says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And we do have so, so much to be thankful for. And Lord, we do thank you for the blessing of salvation, of knowing Jesus, knowing we can come into your presence because of him and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We come to you in the name of Christ today to pray for Gerald and for Carol as Gerald has surgery tomorrow. And Father, we pray that all will go well and that will be a totally successful surgery. We pray for the doctors and nurses that work with him, that you would give them all the wisdom and guidance that they need as well. And may he have a, a quick and, and full recovery. We also do pray, Lord, for Israel and for all that's happening in that part of the country. It's been going on for so long. And we ask, Lord, for peace and we pray, Lord, for wisdom we pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will surround that area and that you would also work here in our own country because we know there are clashings of opinion and wills. And, Father, we pray that you would help our own country to have peace surrounding this as well. Uh, Father, we know that this is something that affects so, so many people, and there's been such a great loss of life in the process. And, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will work in that. Lord, thank you for our congregation here today. We pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to us, open up our hearts for all you have for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah. 
thank you so much for your spirit and we thank you father that you are our heir we're desperate for you this morning lord father if there's anyone here that doesn't know you this morning god let them know that this is the time this is the day you're waiting for them open our ears open our hearts open our minds let us hear from you this morning and revive us in Jesus' name. Amen. We will dismiss our children for children's worship. And may the Lord bless them as they go. We're going to turn our attention in here to James chapter 4. I mentioned last Sunday that our Sunday night group is in a Bible study in the book of James, and I'm appreciative to Miss Amelia and Mr. Crandall for leading us. They're doing a fantastic job. And so last week I preached a message on James chapter 3, and that night, why, we were in James chapter 3 in our Bible study, and I thought, well, let's just keep this going. And so we're going to be in James chapter 4, I believe, tonight, and so we're going to have a message today from James chapter 4. And I'm trying to get this to go, and I'm not getting this to... Oh, hold on just one second. Operator error. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. And so, sometimes it's the simple things, which is, in fact, something I want to mention in my sermon today. And so tonight, we're going to be in James 4, so I'm going to preach a message on James 4, verses 1 through 8, on the subject of prayer. And before I read the scripture... One of the things that we sometimes speak of with prayer is that, 
you know, it's just talking to God, right? Sometimes children use that. Sometimes we even use the idea of like talking on the telephone. And I think that may come from where God says in Jeremiah 33, call unto me and I will answer you. You ever heard that? And show you great and mighty things that you don't even know. Somebody used to say it was God's telephone number, J E R 333, uh, Jeremiah 33 3, call unto me. Well, Reader's Digest one time, somebody submitted this thing to where you know, when you call tech support, it's been a while since I've had to call tech support about a computer problem, but they said if you call tech support, they said these are the things you don't want to hear on the other end of the line, all right? So suppose you are having computer problems and it's giving you a headache, you can't figure it out, you call tech support, the guy answers the phone, you go through the problem, and he goes, dude, bummer. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things you don't want to hear on the other end of the line. It wouldn't give you much confidence, would it? Uh, another one was, you, you explain your problem and the guy goes, well, I, I can help you out, but you're going to need a butter knife, a roll of duct tape, and a hammer. <laughs> and then the, the third one, this was one of my favorites, he, uh, you're, you're, you call the guy up and uh, the, the guy says, hold on just a second, mom, Timmy's hitting me. I'm telling you, with all the kids are learning about computers nowadays, it wouldn't be long before a kid is answering the phone doing these kinds of things. But prayer can be a complex thing, and the good thing is it's, we don't have to use a telephone to call God. You don't have to have a device with you at all times, because God is just a breath away. In fact, you don't even have to talk. We can, he knows our thoughts, and he's always present. He's always there, and he's asking us to come to him. In fact, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. That means that we can always know he's there every moment of every day. And sometimes it can be a difficult thing to understand. And, and, and these verses, we're going to, to see that uh, sometimes we have questions about prayers. And we don't maybe understand why prayers don't get answered. And sometimes things get in the way. And so we see here this in James chapter 4. And here's what it says in the first eight verses. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And it's at this point where he really gets into the idea of prayer. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And then he goes on and says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know, that friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. This is why Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Have you ever had the experience when you're praying that it seems like your prayers just aren't getting anywhere? That you're talking to God and it just seems like your prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling? Or that God just isn't hearing you? That nothing seems to be happening? And sometimes you wonder maybe if prayer even works. You may wonder what's the point. Some people come to the conclusion that God doesn't even exist. They think he's not even up there and they stop praying, they stop believing. But imagine this scenario. Suppose you go out to your car and you try to start it and it doesn't start. When you have that experience... Do you give up on all automation? Do you say, well, automation just is foolish, it doesn't work, and that Henry Ford fella didn't know anything that he was talking about? In fact, I don't even think Henry Ford existed. And this automation stuff is just for the birds. None of it actually works when there's evidence around you that it really does. Now, you wouldn't come to that conclusion, now would you? 
because you know automation does work and there's evidence all around you. Well, the same is true with prayer. The conclusion you would come to with your car in that situation is that the problem's under the hood, that somewhere a connection isn't being made, or maybe something's clogged, or perhaps something's overheated, but something under the hood isn't quite right. And with prayer, if it seems like our prayers aren't getting answered, or if it seems like nothing's happening, the problem isn't that prayer is not working. The problem isn't that God isn't there. That's not the issue. It isn't that God doesn't care. But there's some connection that's not being made. Or maybe the things you're praying for perhaps aren't in God's will. There are all kinds of factors that could enter in. And so don't come to the conclusion that, that God doesn't care or that God doesn't exist because there are some, some diagnostic works that need to be done. And that's kind of what James is doing here in chapter 4. James is kind of doing some troubleshooting in chapter 4 when it comes to our prayer lives. And he says, well, let's look at what could be going wrong so that we can try to, to fix it. And so we're going to look at verse 2 and then verses 3 and 4 and then go down through verses 5 and 8 to look at some of the things that could be off kilter in our prayer lives and how we can get them back on track. So one of the things he mentions is that our hearts can be empty because of unoffered prayer because of unoffered prayer. For example, in verse 2, he says, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And then he said, you do not have because you do not ask God. In the King James Version, he says, you have not because you ask not. What James is saying is that sometimes we don't have the blessing or we don't have the things that we need, or we don't have things that we could use because we haven't even asked. That could be the very reason. And I got to thinking about that, and I wonder if part of the issue for us is that we have become so self-reliant as a people that we think, oh, I can do it myself. I've done it a hundred times. I mean, a preacher might think, how many sermons have I written? I can write another one who needs God. Or a Sunday school teacher could think, how many lessons have I put together? Or a singer could think, how many songs have I sung? Do I really need God's help? You know, you know whatever ministry you're doing, you can think, I've done it a thousand times. And we don't even ask God. If we're not careful, we neglect, and then we don't have the blessing. That's why we have to consciously ask God. And we become self-reliant if we fail to do that. Because we sometimes think that we're smart enough, strong enough. We think we're quick enough, cool enough, clever enough to pull it off ourselves. Well, I've done it before. I don't need God's help. And so we just kind of go on our merry way, and we don't ask God. That's why in Proverbs it says we ought not lean on our own understanding, but to trust in Him and lean upon Him. There's an old story along these lines that talks about a little boy who was out in his backyard trying to move this large stone. It was in his way where he and his friends were wanting to play, and he was, but it was just him at the moment. He was trying to move this big stone, but it was too heavy for him. But boy, he was giving it all he had. I mean, he was gritting his teeth. His face was turning red, and his dad came out. He saw him doing this, and his dad said to him, he said, are, are you giving it all your strength? Are you using all your strength? And the boy, you know, he stopped for a minute, and he's breathing kind of hard. And he said, yes, Dad, I'm using all my strength. And the father said, no, you're not, because you haven't asked me to help. And I wonder sometimes if God's that way with us. If he says, he, he looks down at us and just does the face palm thing, you know, <laughs> and says, you people, I'm right here. You can have power from on high if you just call on me. You can have my help, heavenly help, mighty help, if you just ask me to help. But how often do we go through our programs, our vacation Bible schools, our events, our dinners, and we really want God's help, but we really don't stop and pray and say, Lord, we really need you for this. We talk about bathing our ministries in prayer. 
And we need to make sure that we do that and not get negligent and not letting that happen. There's a verse in 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 25 that I think is a key verse here. How it talks about the weakness of God is stronger than man. And that's an interesting verse to me. Because what it's saying is that if you take the strongest that mankind can be, all the strength we can muster, I think even if you put all the strength of men together, even all the power we could muster and stack it up against God, the weakness of God is stronger than man. God would laugh at our strength. I mean, look what happened when we tried to build the Tower of Babel. To build a tower to heaven, God just stepped back and said, this is such a feeble effort. And he confused their languages and it put an end to that. And God's weakness, I mean, he has more power in his pinky than we do in all of humanity. And so we ought to take advantage of that. It's at our disposal, his power, if we'll just avail ourselves of it. I mean, could it be that one of the reasons that you and I maybe don't have some blessing in our lives or we're not finding wisdom that we need or strength could be the very simple reason that we haven't asked? Maybe you've been struggling in your marriage, but you haven't taken it to God. Maybe your finances have been up in the air, but you haven't taken it to God. Maybe you've been stressed out at work, but you haven't taken it to God. Maybe you're trying to find your place in the church, but you haven't taken it to God. It's just the neglect of not praying. God says you don't have it because you haven't even asked. And God's waiting to give it to us. Sometimes we just have to ask. So this is one reason. I'm not saying it's the only reason, and neither is James. But he says sometimes our hearts can be empty because of unoffered prayer. Now in verses 3 and 4... It gets more serious now. It heats up here now because he starts talking about how our hearts can be corrupted by unacceptable prayer. Now, in verse 3, he starts talking about motives not being right. And then in verse 4, which we'll talk about in a moment, he'll start talking about sin. Now, this is where our hearts can become corrupted. Uh, Here's what he says in verse 3. He says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So our hearts can be corrupted because of unacceptable prayer. So what is he talking about here? Well, a person can pray long and hard about something, but if the reason for their praying for it is wrong, God's not going to grant that prayer. Like let's say you're praying for a promotion. There's nothing wrong with praying for a promotion. And saying, Lord, if this is your will. But if the reason you're praying for a promotion is so that you can rub it in the face of your coworker, then I'm not so sure God's going to grant your request. Or you might be praying that you'll maybe get a certain car or live in a certain neighborhood or be able to buy certain fashion clothes. There's nothing necessarily wrong with those things. But if the reason you're doing it is just so you can show up your neighbor, I don't know if God's going to grant that request. It's not the best motive now, is it? Now, let me say something. This is something we have to constantly check ourselves on. I mean, from the time we're little and we learn what prayer is to the day we die, we've got to continually check our motives in prayer about just about everything we pray for because it's so subtle Selfish motives can just enter in without our even realizing it. And so as we pray, just continually ask yourself, why am I praying for this? Is this for the glory of God? Is this for the best, for my family, for the church, for these people I'm praying for? Or is there some hidden agenda I have? Is there some selfish reason that I'm asking for this? And I'm not saying that we should never pray for ourselves. The Bible's all behind that. We, there are times we do pray for ourselves. Paul prayed for himself. There are some times that we need to pray for ourselves. But again, ask what our motives are. If it's just for self-exaltation, then we might need to reanalyze that and readjust our prayers. 
There was a couple that were pastors and evangelists in the Church of God. They've gone on to heaven now, James and Helen Curtis. Uh, they were friends of ours, too. In fact, he did a revival for us when we were in seminary in Indiana. Um, tell you what kind of humble man he is. He, he, <laughs> we only had one kid at the time, and uh, he slept in our house. We had a small house. He slept on Barney sheets. Remember Barney the dinosaur? You know, he didn't demand some fancy hotel. He slept in our house, and he slept on our son's sheets, Micah's sheets, on Barney sheets. That's a good, humble preacher right there. Well, when he and Helen, his wife, Crandall, you know James and Helen Curtis. I figured you did. Um, they're very involved in the Church of God, and they were very supportive of Mid-America Christian University, which is my and Cindy's alma mater. Crandall attended Mid-America uh, well, when it was at Gulf Coast in Houston. But they were very big supporters of Mid-America. And when they were getting older, James and Helen, Mid-America made an arrangement with them. Because they, they were so supportive of the college, they built the house on campus for Jim and Helen Curtis. And they said, this is your house. And the arrangement was, it's your house until you die, it will be given to the college. Okay, so that was the arrangement. But it's your house. You can do with it what you want. It's your house. You can have it. And then when, you know, when you're done with it, when you all pass away, it'll become the colleges. Well, Forrest Robinson was the president of the school at the time. And one time in one of the chapel services, he made the comment. He said, uh, knowing that if, when James dies, you know, it comes back to the school. He said, Brother James doesn't trust me to pray for him when he gets sick anymore. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Because there again, you got motives, you know. Hmm. But again, it's just one of those things. You got to always check your motives when you pray. Now, another thing he talks about here in verse 4, and he really gets pointed here in verse 4. If you thought verse 3 was tough when he says you get to where you ask for the wrong reasons so that you may consume it upon your own pleasures, well, look what he says in verse 4. He says, You adulterous people. That's strong language right there. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God or against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, a couple of things here I want to mention. First of all, the word enmity has to do with being an enemy. So he says if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. What does it mean to be a friend of the world? It means that you have allowed the practices of the world, the immorality, the profane lifestyles of the world, the values of the world, greed and lust and all of these types of things to become a part of your life. And you become friends with the world. Now, as a born-again believer, you know, we're to separate ourselves from the world. We're not to allow those kinds of values and practices to be a part of us. And what James is saying is if we allow those things into our lives, we become friends of the world and we set ourselves up as enemies of God. And interesting here how he calls them adulterous people. In the King James, he says, you adulterers and adulteresses. And why does he do that? Because they're not necessarily committing physical adultery. It's very interesting to me. So think of it this way. Here's what he's getting at. In the kingdom of God, the church is the bride of Christ. All right, You and I, if you're a born-again believer, you're a part of the church. So you are the bride of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the groom. So Jesus is the groom, and we, as Christians, are the bride of Christ. And so if a born-again believer becomes a friend of the world, and starts living in relation with the world, that is in an unrepentant way. He allows the practices of the world. He starts doing the things the world does. He starts living in lust and greed and pleasure, and he's unrepentant. He's not trying to get out of it. He's kind of accepted it as the way he's living, and he's not struggling with it. He's just letting it become a part of his life. James says it's like you're committing adultery against Jesus. You're cheating on Jesus, you see? And so what James is saying here is that God is not going to subsidize your relationship with the world by answering your prayers. God's not going to underwrite your cheating on Jesus by answering your prayers. Let me, let me give you this example to kind of explain what I'm talking about. Let's suppose there's a woman named Sue who's married 
to a guy named Jeff. Okay, they, they get married, husband and wife. They say, I do, for better, for worse, till death do us part. And they're married for several years. And then Sue begins having an affair with this guy named Terry. And uh, Jeff knows about it. And one day, Sue and Terry decide they want to run off to Miami or somewhere on a rendezvous for a week or whatever. But they're not, they don't have a lot of money. And so imagine Sue goes to her husband, Jeff, and says, hey, Jeff, you know, uh, Ter Terry and I, we want to we go down to Miami for the week. But, you know, we're kind of low on cash. Would you give us some money? You know, we're going to need a rental car, and we're going to need, you know, money for food. We're going to need lodging. You know, you know, a few thousand dollars would be really good. And would you, would you give us the money for that? Well, Jeff is not going to do that. Why, he'd be a fool. He's, he was not going to subsidize his wife's adulterous relationship. He's not going to underwrite that or sponsor that. In any way, he'd be a fool to do so. And that's what James is saying here. If you have a born-again believer who's out living in the world, he's living in sin, and he's unrepentant, he's not trying to get out of it, he's not confessing it, he's just giving in to it, and he's not sorry about it, he's not seeking Jesus. James is saying, you can't expect God to be answering your prayers. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so James is saying, this is an issue with our prayer lives. In addition, of course, to our relationship with Jesus, we have to get back right. So so this is another factor that we have to keep in mind that we have our hearts can be corrupted by unacceptable uh, prayer. So if, if your life is not right, if we're not lined up with God, if we're not seeking Him, if we allow our, our lives to be compromised, it can get into the way of our prayers as well. And then when you hit verse 5 in chapter 4, we start looking at a turn in what James is talking about. So let's look at this part. And here's how we can get our lives in the right attitude of prayer. Our hearts can be blessed because of undefiled prayer. So in verses 5 through 8, James starts talking about how we can get our hearts in line with prayer. If, if we get the sin out of our lives and if we line up our lives for prayer, then there are some things that can happen. Uh, these four things I want to share with you, A, B, C, and D. Uh, Adrian Rogers, who was a great preacher, uh, shared these, and I, I jotted these down, and I want to share these with you. This is from verses 5 through 8. He talked about these four things that enable us to have just an open conversation with God. He said, letter A, sensitivity to the Spirit, verse 5, having a sensitivity to the Spirit. One of the things I like about this idea of being sensitive to the Spirit is that it also will help keep your motives pure. You know how we talked earlier about how it's easy to get our motives off and pray for the wrong reason? Well, if you're sensitive to the Spirit when you pray... And praying, Lord, what is your will? What does the Holy Spirit want to do in me? How do you want to use me? You're much more likely to pray with the right motive. Okay, verse 6, submission to the Father. God gives grace to the proud, but, or grace to the humble. He resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Better not get that backwards. <laughs> he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And when we do that, we are in the will of God when we humble ourselves and we submit to the Heavenly Father. Always remember that prayer is not about bending God's will to our will, but submitting to him. We don't pray and say, okay, here's God's will, and I'm going to bend it to what I want him to do. That is never how prayer works. It's submitting to his will. It's discovering his will. In fact, the Bible says in 1 John, we need to pray in his will. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Very, very important to submit to the Father's will. Letter C is standing against the devil. Verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So stand against the devil. When you pray, prayer is one of the greatest ways to resist the devil, to stand against the devil. You know, the devil doesn't care when we worship. He doesn't care if we sing his praises, but he trembles when we pray because he knows that's our greatest weapon when we pray. Now, he doesn't like it when we sing God's praises, but prayer 
is when he really, really trembles. And then letter D, separation from the world. So verse 8. Verse 8 says that when we come close to God or draw near to God, he will draw near to us. That's a great, great verse. And then it goes on and says, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so it's talking about separating from the world. And in that way, cleansing your heart to pray. Now, in thinking about that, there are, there, you have to remember, you know, God won't answer our prayers if we're facing both directions. You can't be facing God in the world. You can't be in love with God and the world at the same time. Remember how Jesus said, no man can serve two masters? And that's, what's, uh, that's what applies here. And we can't pray these prayers of, um, you know, God bless me anyway. You know, like, um, Lord, I know I'm not living for you right now, but God bless me anyway. Lord, I know I'm living in sin right now, but God bless me anyway. God, I know I don't want to do what you want me to do, but God bless me anyway. We need to separate ourselves from the world. And uh, that doesn't mean we don't have anything to do with the world. Don't misunderstand that. I mean, we live in the world. It's a physical world we live in. But as Jesus said, we live in it, but we don't become of the world. That means we don't accept the world's values and ways of living. And it's a separate thing. Now, Adrian Rogers, who I said shared those four things, he also told a story in, in this that I want to close with about when he was in uh, college in Florida. And he was away, I guess, for spring break or something, and back at his home church. And somebody, before he left to go back to school, wanted to give him some oranges. And uh, he said he had like several bags, like sacks of oranges. And Adrian Rogers said to him, you know, we'll never eat these before they spoil. There's just too many of them. And he said, well, just take them and just give them away. And he said, okay. So they, they take back several bags of oranges to their apartment, Adrian and his wife. Well, one day around noon, several days had gone by. They'd given away a few of the oranges, but they still had several bags in their pantry. And Adrian and his wife were eating lunch one day. And they looked out their backyard, and there was a little boy who was kind of sneaking around. You see, Adrian and them had a, one orange tree in their backyard. But Adrian said it produced sour oranges. And I, have, I don't know that I've really eaten a sour orange, at least not that bad. But he says they are about the worst thing that you could ever, ever eat. They're just awful. And he was watching this boy. It looked like he was just up to no good, you know. And they just watched him. And sure enough, he stole an orange off of one of his orange trees. And he took off running. And Adrian Rogers said, now, what do you think would have happened if instead of stealing that orange... That boy had come up to my door and said, Now, mister, would it be okay if I took one of the oranges off of your tree? I would have said to him, Son, you don't want one of those oranges. They're no good. But if you come in here just a minute, I've got more oranges than you could carry. And they're the best oranges. They've come from a beautiful orange grove in the best part of Florida, and these are the best oranges you could have, and you can have a whole bag of them to take with you if you want. He said, that's what I would have done. And he said, you know, in heaven, I wouldn't be surprised if when we get to heaven, God takes each one of us to a room and opens up the door and says, I want you to see in this room, these are all blessings that I wanted to give you if you'd only asked. Or if you'd only asked with the right motives. <laughs> or if you'd been sincere or whatever reason. But just things he wanted to bless us with, but for whatever reason, we just weren't in the right place. And so as we think about James chapter 4, Think about centering our lives in Christ and making sure our hearts are sincere in Him when we pray. Some of the most important things about prayer are making sure that we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus mentioned that numerous times. 
That means that we come based on his merit, not because of who we are. And praying in accordance to the will of God is one of the most important things. We're not going saying, Lord, this is what I demand. This is what I expect. But humbly saying, Lord, what is your will in this situation? And seeking out his wisdom. Where we remember he is the creator. We are the creation. And we need to seek his will. Besides, his wisdom is so much greater than ours, isn't it? Because you know that verse that says that his weakness is stronger than man? That same passage also says that his foolishness is wiser than man. That's how smart he is. Let's stand together as we pray. Our Lord Jesus, we are so grateful today for your word that instructs us. Thank you for this passage in James chapter 4. And it's so instructive and reminds us of some important things about prayer. And Lord, one of the most important things is just the basic idea of us spending time in prayer. It becomes so easy in a fast-paced world of ours for us to get distracted and get involved in other things where we just don't take the time to pray. And then what James wrote becomes so true. We don't have because we don't ask. And it's not that we want things so much as we just want your guidance and wisdom and infilling of the Holy Spirit your power in our lives, so that we will have your direction and guidance each and every day. Lord, lead us in all these things, we pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. It's good being in the Lord's house with you this morning. Remember, as you go, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Let that be a verse you take throughout this week. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord. Go in peace.